Okay, we're going to go right into that's the here, uh, DCFS presentations at the point. Uh, yes, that's first on the agenda. I thought this would be better for the yeah. public comment. Sorry. How do you want to handle it? Get prepared to make a presentation. Okay. What, what we've asked okay. DCFS to do is to come in and, and help us understand what is being done differently now that Gabriel has died and from all accounts should not have. Uh, and I want to clear that we are not here to, to uh, crucify the social workers involved. I, I believe from the social workers that I've met in that department that they are loving people who came into this profession to protect children. I also believe that every indication is the system itself is seriously flawed. I think that there are people that are accountable for how that system's flawed. I think that it goes beyond just the department. I think county council has a lot, a lot of the responsibility to bear. And I would like to hear from them. How do we know that in the city of Lancaster, one, there's not going to be excessive enforcement, meaning a simple, a simple solution is every time there's a complaint, just take the kids. Now, understand what that entails. Every time you do that to a child, you inflict psychological damage onto him that sometimes lasts a lifetime. It is a very difficult decision to make when you take a child out of the home because you know when you do, you are inflicting damage. And it, it, it's a hard decision for them to make. But we also see a situation where they could do better. And we want to know what they're going to do. And we know that at least in the city of Lancaster, our children are going to be safe. And with that, I'm sorry, I don't have this. Brandon Nichols. I'm a senior deputy director with the Department of Children and Family Services. I appreciate you inviting us up here uh, to talk to you, to talk to the community. I want to say before we get into the uh, questions of what we're doing to improve our services in the community, I just want to pause a second and say that the death of that child was tragic. It eats at my heart, it eats at the heart of our social workers, and I appreciate you acknowledging their commitment to the job and the hard work they do for children. And I do want to say, before I go into our brief presentation, after which I'll be happy to answer questions, uh, nothing we say here tonight is going to make that death okay. Uh, we realize that that child uh, could have been saved. There is a failure uh, in the system, and that child's death uh, could have been prevented. So with that, I want to introduce uh, my companions here, Scott Miller, Senior Deputy County Council, Marion Fatemi. Deputy Director with the Department of Children and Family Services. It is her offices that serve this community, Lancaster and Palmdale. Her name again, please? Mariam Fatemi. So with that, we have a quick PowerPoint. Uh, this will give an overview of our department's operations, uh, both across the county and within this community. And at the end of that, we have a brief discussion of some of our major reforms. As you can see, we received 202,198 calls to the hotline. The volume in this county is an issue. Uh, it is an issue that we struggle with, and in comparison to other jurisdictions, uh, we are much, much larger. And that volume itself creates uh, its own problems and its own challenges. Of those 202,198 calls, 181,827 resulted in referrals. That means that there was some action uh, that we had to take uh, in response. Of those referrals, 154,930 required an in-person response. We sent a person out to view a child, out to meet with a family, 154,930 times. Can you go to the next slide? Currently, I'm sorry, county year uh, 2012, we had 35,195 children under our care. Of those children, 13,945 uh, received services in their own home. They remained with their families. Uh, 21,250 were removed from their homes, and you can see that our preference is placement with relatives. Of that number, uh, the large majority 
was placed with relatives, that is always our first choice. Can we go to the next slide? This is a brief uh, overview of our staffing countywide. We have 6,720 staff. Uh, of those staff, 2,091 are social workers, and about 400 are supervising social workers. This is a view of our services here in this community. We have 12,322 children that we served in this area. Lancaster um, was 6,532. We have 947 average investigations per month in this area. The next one. Here is our complement of staff in this area, 180 social workers and 33 supervisors, the Lancaster office, 94 social workers, 16 supervisors. Next slide. So you asked, what are we going to do to prevent a tragedy like this in the future? And that is a question we ask ourselves almost every day. We have meetings on it regularly, and we have been asking it since each of us came to the department. One of the major initiatives that we've undertaken is the development of a strategic plan. The department had not had a strategic plan for years, and we sat down with our managers, with the community, with other stakeholders to develop 33 key initiatives that we believe will improve our services, both countywide and here within the community. Those improvements centered around the bullet points you see here, but it is to emphasize child-centered practice, to better engage families so we can make that kind of difficult balancing decision, uh, not based on just fear, or um, here or factors other than the, an assessment of how a family and a child interact in their home and whether service can, can be offered to safely maintain children in their homes. Go to the next slide. We have reorganized our department to provide greater accountability over the two functions of the department. The department has two primary functions. One is investigation of allegations of abuse or neglect, and the other is to provide services to ameliorate the need to maintain children in, out of their home or to maintain contact with the family, to allow them to return back to the community uh, on their own with appropriate supports. Those functions in the past have been co-mingled under a single manager. We have provided them. So now we will have one manager in each area responsible for just the investigative piece and one manager in each area responsive, responsible for the back end piece. That way, when there's a problem, you can call one person and say, how come this happened under your watch? Next slide. Critical thinking, common sense, uh, a desire to dig deeper, to conduct complete investigations, that is the piece that is our primary focus. Our staff need better training, both before they come to the department and while they're at the department. There is no question about that. They're good intention. They need support. To provide that, we have met with a consortium of local universities to completely revamp how they provide training to our staff, both before they come to the department and once they're in the department. Next slide. Re Doing the policy manual is another significant initiative that we've undertaken. Our policy manual looks like a phone book, and it has been commented that no one could know all of the details in that phone book. No staff person could be familiar, forward to back, with every requirement, every comma, every form. It was not providing the support and guidance to our staff that they need to perform their duties. So we have a engaged an outside consultant to completely revise our policy. And it is a difficult undertaking. We cannot land the plane, get off, rebuild it, and then take it off. We have to fly the plane and rebuild it in the air at the same time. So we have brought in outside resources. They're going to completely revise our entire body of policy, and they're going to update it. They're going to put it on the web for us, for the communities. So the community can see what our policy looks like. It will be searchable and much more functional, but importantly, it will provide guidance and support to staff on how they are supposed to be doing their jobs. 
So I wanted to close with some important phone numbers because I think you observed, and I agree, that it takes a community, and we need the community to interact with us and to let us know when children are in need of help, to let us know what resources are available, and to volunteer and serve as foster parents for when children can't safely remain in their homes. And these are the numbers to help us do that. The Public Inquiry Office, should people have questions, is 213-351-5602. Our Child Protection Hotline, where people can report concerns about a child's safety. And I encourage, notwithstanding this tragic case, the community to engage us when they have concerns. And that number is 800-540-4000. And our Resource Family Recruitment Number, where people can volunteer to foster and adopt children in need of a good home or in need of a safe placement temporarily while their family receives services uh, so that they can receive their children back, uh, is 888. 811121. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Nichols, what specifically is DCFS going to do to make sure that what happened to Gabriel doesn't happen again? You know, we hear, we've heard a lot of goals, lofty goals, but what specifically will be done? I don't know what you mean when you say specifics. We are revising our policy manual. That will help prevent things when? like Gabriel, uh, tragedies like that. We have uh, a new manager who is coming to this area. She is one of our best, and your existing manager in this area is also one of our best. Today, the Board of Supervisors, the agency that has direct oversight over us, um, voted to uh, create a blue ribbon panel there will be a, uh, like the panel that recently uh, issued recommendations for jail reform, they will examine our operations and come up with direct action plans to improve our services both across the county in this community. We any dates in mind? When, when is any of this going to happen? If that vote was today, the recommendations from that panel are due before the end of the year, I believe. The work I discussed briefly in the PowerPoint is ongoing. We are already starting to see uh, some of those objectives come to fruition and be implemented. When's the training going to occur? Uh, training is occurring now. It is, as I mentioned, we you know, have to rebuild the plane while we fly it. So we do have training that is needed today, right now. We are in negotiations with the consortium of universities to revamp our training. Uh, I do not know the due date of that, but I believe that it is within a year. We will have entirely new training for staff. Mr. Nichols, while I can appreciate all these statistics that you've put in front of us, there's only one number right now that I think this community is concerned with, and that's the one that got by you, Gabriel. Yes, I'm um, not I, I understand that, the, that you've developed a strategic plan, and you've got 33 key initiatives, but unless they're robust, they mean nothing. I mean, I would like to tell you that we are going to look at that case, draw lessons learned, create corrective action plans, and all of that is true, but I'm hesitant because I don't want to make it sound like any of that will make Gabriel okay. That was a tragedy, and I don't want to say, we're going to take care of it by making subsequent corrective efforts. We are. We continue to try to improve our, play, our systems, our services to families. What we have learned from Gabriel will impact that, but I'm hesitant to draw connections between Gabriel and specific actions I don't want to make it seem like it was an okay thing. But when you take and you put four people that were part of this process, and you put them on desk duty, so you've exacerbated the numbers, you've compounded the problem, what do you see in the near future within the next 30 to 60 days that's going to happen that's going to correct that problem? We are conducting a personnel investigation of the staff involved in Gabriel's case. We hope to have that investigation completed I believe the projected due date is July 8th, and we will take, if it's appropriate, disciplinary action uh, with the staff involved, depending on what the investigation uh, discovers. I'm hesitant to talk about the particulars of that investigation because it is ongoing. No, and I understand that. I can appreciate that. But, but I, th I think we all go back to the old adage that it takes a vill village to raise a child. But in this case, I, I think we've all failed. We failed Gabriel. And we failed his siblings because I understand his siblings had been removed from the home, their protective custody. 
What's happening with them now? Is there counseling being given? The details, uh, our lawyer, Scott Miller, the, the details of any services we're providing to a family are confidential under law. I've been advised, and I believe it's true, that it is a misdemeanor for me to discuss those details. Uh, That's, let's deal with that. You have a system where it is a crime to put the light of day on it. You have a system that nobody is allowed to talk about what happens in those individual cases under penalty of imprisonment. How is that possible in America? That you can you you have this incredible power to rip families apart, or in Gabriel's case, not rip them apart, and yet it is a crime for us to look at it. And it seems to me that, and we'll talk about county council in a moment, it seems to me that your department should be the one screaming to Sacramento to change that law. But the truth is, is you lobby for it. Isn't that true? I don't know that we lobbied for it. I think that the, the decision was made in Sacramento, and you're correct in that, it, there are some benefits to that law. Families are entitled to privacy. We do not want to be discussing their business in the streets. It is delicate. They are personal details. Nevertheless, there have been changes in the law recently, particularly when a child dies, that allows for some release of information. In this case particularly, there is information we can release. We have released it. I brought it with me tonight. I'd be happy to share it with your counsel before I leave. Um, there are also mechanisms to open case files. Some of the press, I believe, in this room have started those procedures to request opening of Gabriel's file. That requires a court order. We are not opposing those requests. And we assist the press in um, facilitating them filing those documents. But it does require a court order. And absent that court order, unfortunately, I can't discuss it. it. Isn't it also true that your department does not allow either the parent or the parent's lawyer to tape record the interviews that the social workers conduct. Isn't that true? I don't know if that's true or not. I can tell you with absolute certainty it is. And in fact, if the, if the parent insists upon it, the interview is concluded. And it is reported to the court that the parent refused to cooperate. Now my question to you is, why isn't the social worker required to tape record every interview? And now when we have cases like Gabriel, it is not a question of he said or she said. It becomes a question of here's the tape. Here's what was said. This is why I did this action or did not do this action. Well, that's what's so great about the court process, because the parent and their lawyer have an opportunity to come down and explain directly to the court, eye to eye with the judge. This is what I said. This is what I mean. This is why I said it. And the judge has the ability to weigh the credibility of the social worker and the parent. Aren't you embarrassed with something as fatuous as that? For heaven's sakes, we are talking about a department where social workers have been in my office and they tell me that they are required to change their reports on almost a weekly basis. Almost a weekly basis. And it is, goes from county council to the supervisor to the supervisor supervisor sometime. And nobody has to sign that report except the social worker. And you have a department full of social workers that are the most stressed out people alive. Your health, the, the health crisis within your department is an abomination. You would agree with that, wouldn't you? Our social workers are absolutely stressed. An incident like this impacts the whole office. We offer them um, assistive services because they start to have breakdowns. They start to uh, wring their hands and hug each other. A death like this impacts them in ways I can't explain. You, you just have to see their faces. No, I have seen their faces, and what they tell me is you put them on desk duty, which means they are required to sit at a desk and do absolutely nothing. They come into work and they sit there while their co-workers walk by staring at them. That is a supportive environment you're trying to tell this community if you've provided. I have talked to those people myself, and that is what they tell me they do. And when they walk into my office, they're like this. And they are like that not just because of Gabriel. They are like that because of your lack of support for them. Isn't that true? 
Is no, it there's true they're on desk duty? There are staff on desk duty that has been reported in the paper. It is not due to a lack of support. We offer them and we offer the office support. But like when there is a law enforcement involved shooting, we need to take immediate steps to make sure that everybody is safe until we can investigate the facts underlying the shooting, or in this case underlying a fatality, to ensure that our staff acted appropriately on this case and will act appropriately with other children out in the community. Then why don't you let them go home while the investigation takes place rather than compound the problem? Because what I'm afraid is going to happen, I'm afraid you're going to scapegoat those people. I think that what's going down is we're going to get a report how they were just abominable and how they conducted this investigation. And that may or may not be true, but what I also know to be true would be on any doubt, and I think you will agree with this, your department is underfunded, understaffed, and underloved. Wouldn't you agree with that? I agree with all that last stuff. I don't know that I agree with the scapegoating part, and that is why we conduct an investigation and going back to the Then let them go home. That is why it takes time. That's then let them go home. Recognize that these people are stressed out to the max. <laughs> and what they need is your support, not your condemnation. And when you make them sit at that desk with absolutely nothing to do, and having their, their peers literally being put in a situation to treat them as if they're a pariah, you are compounding the stress. And I, I, but let me go on a little bit. I think I, I, I've made that clear to you, and hopefully you might take some corrective action. There have been members of your department that have come to me and said they want to come forward. They want to, to, to talk about what is going on between county council and the supervisors of DCSF, or however, DCSF, yeah. So what that's, how do you say DCFS. I always get those letters mixed up. They want to come forward. They would like to publicly reveal Things like, isn't it also true that the thing they hear from the day they come to work is we speak with one voice. The department speaks with one voice. You've heard that, haven't you? I have not, and I will say that that is not true. I attend meetings regularly where there is a diversity of opinion, sometimes publicly, even argument. Publicly? I have seen a diversity of opinion publicly, yes. I, I have never let, seen that. Let me say, if you have staff from our department coming to you saying, I need to tell somebody something, they should contact me. What they tell me is they will be retaliated against. And what I'm asking you is will you go to the Board of Supervisors and ask them to guarantee there will be absolutely no retaliation, that there will be an ombudsman they can go to if there is even a hint of it, so that this Blue Ribbon Committee can actually investigate something in a meaningful way. Would you be willing to do that? Absolutely. I would recommend the Board of Supervisors no retaliation for anybody that has something no, 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 not, to say. Not just the words that the Board of Supervisors put in place a system that will guarantee these people they will not be retaliated against. And what I'm asking you is when will you go to the Board of Supervisors and ask them to do that? I don't know that there's not a system in place today to guarantee that. Why don't you know? Today, You're second in command. In Why don't you of, know? In front of these cameras in this community, absolutely, staff should be free to tell managers, to tell you, to tell people like me that there are problems in the department and not fear for retaliation. I will make that recommendation right now in front of the That's table. not what I asked you to do. What I asked you to do is ask the supervisors to put in place a system that will guarantee they are protected when they come forward. And what I'm asking you is when will you ask the Board of Supervisors to do that? I don't exactly know what that means, but I, I'm telling you now, staff can Staff can tell us that there are problems in the department today and not be retaliated against. They should come to me. They should come to you today they and have tell us what the issues are. And you should refer them to me so that we can hear the issues and act on them. I, and I will tell the Board of Supervisors that that is something that should happen. They, one of them went out the back door today. Isn't that right, Mark? You escorted him out the back door because he was afraid you and, might see him. And I will say that the county has a an elaborate, well-resourced mechanism for raising complaints and issues, both about programs and for retaliation. Today, it is 
staffed by lawyers and experts. There are forums. It is e easily accessible to all of our staff. All of our staff have had uh, training on it. And so in part when you say develop a mechanism, that's the part I don't understand because I believe we have those mechanisms today, but I will confirm them when I am done with this meeting. Let, let me tell you that your employees don't have any faith in it. Did he ask, did, didn't he ask to be escorted out the back so they wouldn't know who he was? Uh, yes, about half an hour. And, okay, and, let, me, and, let me go on. Let me go on. Not the mechanism, I think. It's the face of the employees. That's why I'm standing here now saying, send them to me, I will hear them out, and I will make sure that they are not retaliated against. But do not sit on information and not distribute it to the people who can act on it to make a difference. I, I, I see that problem, and we have that problem. We have significant documentation that we, we, we're in a quandary. What do we do with it? We've been asked to keep it confidential. I don't know what to do with it. But let me let me proceed. I mean, what I, I saw. I we'll go back to it. Good. If you have relevant information and it sits on your desk, it does not help us. It does I, not help children like Gabriel. It doesn't help the community. We have to get it to the hands of people that can I agree. consider it. I agree. But, and what I'm telling you is we're in a quandary what to do with it. Because these people really are afraid. Whether it's a justified fear or an unjustified fear. You read it. Any doubt it's valid? You know, we ourselves have been involved in cases where we have seen records altered, we have seen doctors' doctors' opinions being withheld, we have seen very questionable behavior, and what we have seen is that that is because you're allowing the prosecution arm to dictate to the investigation arm. If the district attorney's office was allowed to control the sheriff's department, we would not have freedoms in this country. Separating those two offices, everybody knows, is critical to the to the well-being of our country. And what I and you seem to get that the the supervision of the in, in family services should be separate from the investigation. Why is county council allowed to be so involved in every single aspect? He stands behind you and whispers in your ear, and that is the same person that prosecutes the cases against the parents when they take the kids. Don't you think that department should be separated? A couple of points on that. We take falsification as a cardinal sin within the department. We terminate staff when we find that they, that they have falsified documents. We, no, no, they don't falsify it. They get somebody else to falsify it. If we discover falsification, we take it very seriously. But as to your point about county council, it is a system that the legislature has set up. The nature of our system, when we cannot work cooperatively with a family, is that we have to go to the juvenile court and use the authority of that court to either remove a child from that family or to order parents into services that they are, at the time, reluctant to engage in. By going to court, the very nature of that venue, as you know, is a litigious, adversarial... I've uh, never seen more lawyers in my life. You know, there every, are, every child, every adult, every, uh, there's more lawyers in those cases than you can imagine. I agree. I think it's a system designed to just keep us employed, to tell you the truth. Too many lawyers. I, I could <laughs> totally agree with you. Too many lawyers there and elsewhere. But the truth is, the legislature has decided... Careful with that elsewhere business. <laughs> I am a lawyer. You're a lawyer. I have great respect for lawyers. But we complicate things. When social workers and parents talk, they talk in a different way than when a social worker and their lawyer and a parent and their lawyer talk. All of a sudden, the social worker and the parent get quiet, and the lawyers just fight. It is in our nature. We're doing pretty good right now, but we do. We, we get our backs up, and we like to fight. Because sometimes a social worker and a parent cannot work cooperatively, and a child is at risk as a result, we have no choice but to go to court and involve the lawyers. The nature of our system and the nature of our operation is very heavily driven by statute and regulation and the court process, and we need counsel to navigate that process because it is difficult and social workers are not experts on laws. They need neither, neither are deputies. And there is a separation between the district attorney's office and the sheriff's department. And those deputies do not report to the district attorney in any way. 
But what I have seen, at least in the Animal Valley, with your department, is that county council is unquestionably in charge and unquestionably directing how things get written, how investigations, and I've seen them actually go head to head a little bit with the social workers who didn't want to go along. You know, and I, and I would, you, would you your, agree that the possibility exists? I can't speak to your personal appearances, and I can agree that there is that possibility, but I will tell you that structurally, like the district attorney and the sheriff's office, we are separate departments, we have separate chains of authority, we answer to different bosses, and we do get into disagreements sometimes. But at the end of the day, when our social worker needs guidance on whether there are legal grounds to go to court and file a petition, they have no choice but to turn their attorneys, and we are thankful that those attorneys are there to assist us. Let me ask you this. Do the supervisors have the ability to direct the social workers and how the report is prepared? The supervisors do have the ability to give guidance and counsel to their staff. They do not have the ability to change facts. So if what you're asking is what I asked you, was it? Well, I don't know what you're asking. Okay, but, let me give you an why, example. And that's why I'm parsing it out. Okay. They cannot direct a change in facts. What they can say is, uh, report needs to be at a certain time. Report needs to be in a different format. I think you need to look at this issue. It's not explored enough. You need to go back out and maybe ask some of these questions. It is our supervisor's responsibility to ensure the thoroughness of those reports, the accuracy of those reports, and they do that. But they don't say, hide this fact change that detail. Let me give you an example of what was reported to me in just one case, where a father comes home and finds out that the nine-year-old had shot the five-year-old with a BB gun. He was a little bit upset. When the nine-year-old did that, he ran to a neighbor because he knew he was in big trouble. When he came home, this is how the social worker initially wrote it. The father spanked him with a belt. And we can go into all, that debate all day long about whether or not it's appropriate or not appropriate, but I can tell you that, that my father had a very thick belt. <laughs> the, and, and I can understand why he used it. <laughs> anyway, that report gets changed, meaning the social worker is directed to write it this way. Father beats the nine-year-old with a belt. The nine-year-old was reported at a neighbor's house hiding in fear of a beating. And somehow nobody mentioned what the nine-year-old had done. That continually happens, where because of an influence of, and, and this is what they tell me, the influence of the county council in how these things are written, that it's not actually a lie, but it's clearly a different story. Facts that exonerate are clearly left out. And we hear that this happens frequently. And I just want you to be open to the possibility that there is a system that we could put in place that would make people more accountable for that. Isn't there? I appreciate you raising these issues. It's difficult for me to speculate what happened in that particular case, what was written, what the facts were. And it's a secret. We go to jail if we, do, if we find out too much, right? It's not a secret to me. And if you hear those things, like I said before, bring them to my attention. Oh, we do. We, I, we've got a book. I mean, it's I, this thick. But I have I the like authority to, to review them and to act on them. And if that's happening, it's an issue I take very seriously. In, in part because of my experience as a lawyer, I understand the relationship between lawyers and social workers. Okay, and what, they, so what specifically happen. will you do to make this so it doesn't ever happen again? Well, it's hard to speculate without seeing exactly what's going on, but that's why I'm saying if you have information, I, I urge you to please share it with me so as, that I can take a look at it. As soon as we can convince these people that they're safe, we will. And I'd be happy to meet with them myself. If, I, if that I, think, I think we might want to press there with some protections. But again, I come back to one thing. It's very simple. Tape record the interviews. And then you, not so anybody else necessarily can, can hear them, so you so, can so listen I, to the interview and look at the report and see if it's accurate. I'll, I'll, with all due respect, I believe that there's never just one easy answer to questions like this. I don't think taping, tape recording interviews necessarily solves the problem that we're dealing with. 
There may be an issue. It might help though, right? I want to dig into it. It may have negative consequences too, though. When you're a social worker, asked to go into someone's house in the middle of the night, and asked to talk to a child, have you been touched by your parent? Did somebody hit you? To send a tape recorder down on the table and say, I'm recording everything you say, may change the dynamic between that social worker and the person they're interviewing. And I don't know today, standing at this podium, that I can agree it's a good idea. What I will agree with is, I'm happy to talk about it, and it would help me to talk about it if I could see some of the places and some of the actual facts where it has resulted in an injustice. Well, what we know from the Sheriff's Department, and I'm sure he's the captain here. Here's the captain. They sent you to take the, the, the heat, right? <laughs> the, your deputies have, have, are able to tape, but no one knows they're taping them, right? Right. Uh, it, you, have you found it in any way to inhibit the investigatory abilities? Uh, in, in, in certain instances, uh, in uh, suspect interviews, it may uh, prevent some suspects from uh, speaking to them, taking them over, is it, is it the general practice to take record them? Yeah. And I would be happy to discuss that issue with you. I'm just saying today, at this podium, based on our brief exchange, I can't tell you I think it's a good idea. So when are we going to discuss it? I'm available at your convenience. Okay. I mean, you're willing to, to look at it, see if we can move in that direction. Not only am I willing, I encourage you to share that information with you. If, if with me. If you think it's important and you think there is injustice as a result, absolutely, I want to meet with you. We've got a story to tell. Thank you. Any other questions? I'd like to thank your staff for their courtesy. They were very nice and accommodating us with the PowerPoint. They gave me water. They uh, saved us some nice chairs. Oh, you know, it, it makes something like this. Bearable? <laughs> well, bearable is a little strong. But, uh, <laughs> You know, again, I want to reiterate, most of my experience with the social workers has been nothing but positive. I really do think, I also think, though, that they suffer from vicarious victimization, and I don't think that their, their health needs are being met by the county. More importantly, what, how many more social workers have been assigned to this area today? Because what we know for an absolute fact coming from the, the circumstances around Gabriel, is we don't have enough. And we don't have enough social workers across the county. We have asked the Board of Supervisors, and it is a big ask and unlikely to be granted because of the sheer cost for a 1,000 social workers. But we have recently, I believe, hired 50. We're in the process of redeploying them. Uh, and we are hiring uh, in the right. future, minute, I believe, 100 I'm sorry. We need 1,000 more, we and have, they gave you 50? We have asked for 1,000. We have gotten 50, we're getting 100 more. Social workers are expensive. This is an area that is undervalued and underfunded. How many did we get? I don't know. I mean, I wish I could be, I, I I wish I could be concerned I could about the rest of the county. Plan. I didn't come prepared for that info, but it's easy for me to find out. We would appreciate knowing that. Absolutely. And we'd also, we'd also appreciate knowing what is the recommended number. Yes. All right? Thank you. Mr. Nichols, if you had a wish list, even though that the incidents with Gabriel didn't happen in Lancaster. If you had a wish list, what would you want from the city of Lancaster to help you? Engagement between our social workers and the community is critical. We need to know when children are in need of help, when families are in need of help. We need resources to refer those children and families to churches, community-based organizations, therapists, mental health counseling, drug and alcohol counseling, all of those resources we need access to and we need a partnership with. Most importantly though is the child abuse hotline. If somebody sees a child that they think may be the subject of abuse or neglect, we need them to call the hotline so that we can engage with the family. Another issue though that we have struggles with, both in this community specifically but across the county, is parents willing to foster our children. When a child can't be safely maintained in the home, we need another family to step in and take that child into their home until we can repair the relationship between the originating family and the child. Are, your, are your social workers working with our faith-based community as far as with our community homes? I know that they are, but we can always work better. 
that is the truth. And if you have resources available, or if someone's listening to me now and potentially could serve as a resource, again, I would urge you and them to contact us. You know, the, the other thing I want to clarify, you know, our supervisor, Mike Antonovich, has been sounding the alarm about this situation for a long time. This isn't the first time your department has, has been not requested, but demanded to take corrective action. What are you doing different this time? Well, that was the very topic that was addressed at the Board of Supervisors today. That's why uh, the Director, Philip Browning, couldn't be here, because he had to meet with our board, with Supervisor Antonovich. Aren't you lucky? On that issue. Yeah, it was my turn. To, uh, on the wheel. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, I will say, I have some connections to this community, and it's got a special place in my heart, so I'm actually was glad it was me that they came up. But that said, the Blue Ribbon Task Force is going to be uh, a notable difference. It is a tool that the board has used uh, in the context of the jails, and they have seen substantive changes and reform, it's now our turn to engage with the Blue Ribbon Task Force. Supervisor Antonovich has had a role in that. Okay. I, I just want to be clear. We have found his reaction to this to be incredible from years ago. He, I mean, he, this he has always been a priority for him. Great attention and great leadership Thanks. around our department and our issues. Okay, great. Just so we're clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's take a break and then we'll be back. Okay. Yeah. We have, oh, we got speaker cards? Or? I'm so sorry. Um, two weeks ago, the welfare department came to my house with allegations that my daughter, 17 year old daughter, was being molested by an uncle, which is not true. From day one to this time, I've not heard any attorney, uh, welfare, sheriffs, anybody come tell me anything about the case. The hotline doesn't work because my wife tried calling that before my son got murdered. I'm here to voice my grandson and the others that fell through your system of DSS, Welfare Department and Sheriff's Department. And for those that haven't got caught doing a simple job or investigation as to look to see for any bruising cuts or etc. I would not be here today telling you about my grandson and others being abused or murdered instead of maybe, in my daughter's and boyfriend's case, only abused. I really think that the whole system, and especially those that got fired or just simple death assignments, I think they ought to be prosecuted, thrown in jail, just as my daughter and the boyfriend are. I thank you. Thank you. Sherry Martin. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Um, I have parents of murdered children of the Antelope Valley. I have been helping Robert. I have a question. If any of us had a child in danger, where our child was in a dangerous position, I would be yanked up, thrown in jail, and convicted of child endangerment. Now, Mayor, I heard you speaking about these old social workers. Yes, there are some good ones, but you also said that they all should speak in one voice. I totally no, 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 no. I said that's what they're required to do. Well. In a sense, I think that's good. When you see one worker, it's, you should be seeing every one should be on the same page. You can give a worker a situation and have four of them, five of them come and look at it, and you'll get, oh my God, or you'll get, ah, no big deal. And with, with Robert, with, I'm sorry, with Gabriel, <coughs> The neighbors reported it. The teacher reported it. Robert took pictures and gave pictures. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Browning should be fired. We're talking about people that have got major education. They have master degrees. I don't understand why the system fails. And it hasn't just failed here. About three weeks ago, there was a little toddler 
I don't remember what city, but it was down below. The doctor reported a suspicious break. Social services said, oh, he's okay. A week later, that child was dead by the hands of the father. Children do not have any victim's rights. Mr. Mayor, if I came up and punched you in the face, I would be arrested. I would be put in jail. You would have a restraining order against me. Why doesn't a child have that same right? I really respect Supervisor Antonovich. I think he's an amazing man. I'm very much opposed to this blue panel thing. They already have a special unit that was put up in 08. What good's it done? How many children have been murdered since then under the care of social services? I have a lot more to say, but I'm Thank you. Uh, M. Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council, City Manager. First and foremost, my condolences to Gabriel's grandparents and all other family members and loved ones. You're in my, uh, you are in my prayers. I want to thank the courageous teacher that came forward and asked others to do when they see real abuse. Thank you to the mayor and the, the uh, <coughs> uh, city manager for this forum. This is an important issue to the community. Thank you, Mike Antonovich and the Blue Ribbon uh, Commission. Uh, I wish this were done years ago when community members like myself were coming forward with concerns. Um, internal investigations by Department of Children and Family Services result in nothing. The state legislature needs to get involved. This is much bigger than Gabriel. This is, this is an ongoing thing. Uh, the social workers are overstaffed. And one of the reasons why is because a large percentage, some say as high as 70% of the children that are taken out of the homes are done so because of uh, false reporting. A non-custodial parent or grandparent or other interested party will make a false allegation to the DCS so they can get custody of that child to use later in family court. A lot of times, I think the majority of times, and the county has admit that, that that child is placed with the person that reported. They are then given thousands of dollars to house that child and abused in those situations. What I'm alleging is they're taken out of safe homes and, and put into unsafe homes. Now for every one of those children, that's one less social worker that can focus on real abuse. The county is aware of it, DCFS is aware of it, and they've covered it up for years. Um, the reason why they don't take the reports is because the child's statement will conflict with the written report later, Mayor. No, I know that. I know okay. that. Okay. Now, I would like to ask the uh, Department of Children and Family Services right here. You, you don't get to do that. I'm sorry. Uh, you gotta, okay. You gotta Let me ask you, you, Mr. Mayor, what percentage of the children that are taken are, are from false accusations? I don't think anybody has any idea. But you got to remember, it's incentivized to do that. The, right. you know, and federal, why we don't have any idea? I'm going to give you our time. Okay. You know, how the system no, works. I want, I want to hear is, is every time they take a child, they get money from the federal government. You know, the, the, and, and I don't, I'm not casting aspersions on people for that. What I'm saying is we've created a system that is incentivized to fail. Because when you, when you have social workers that are, are taught to... to to write the facts in a certain way to get a certain result. Why are we surprised that that may have occurred in Gabriel's case? Just to avoid having to investigate it appropriately. You know, I don't know that that's ha what happened, but I know that certainly the rumors going around is that there was reports that never actually were done. But if you teach people to do that, why would you be surprised that you are now the victim of that? You know, if there is one area of our government that should be scrupulously honest, it has to be children's services. I mean, there should be very real consequences when the child's statement conflicts with what the report says. There, you know, that, and that is exactly why they're not taping it. It's because there is no accountability. 
Yes, sir. And there should also be consequences against those who knowledgeably and, and, and purposefully make false reports that result in those children being taken. Certainly, those, they shouldn't be rewarded with thousands of dollars, our taxpayers' dollars, that the county gives. But those we people should incentivizing be, people to lie. But those people should be charged with a felony. Now, I, as, now I, I hope the people that were directly responsible for Gabriel's death are put in prison forever and can never hurt another kid again. But I hope that the people that were indirectly responsible for his death, without naming names, were fired, and some of them go to jail too. But the main thing being that... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are responsible for Gabriel. The government, you know, the city, county, all of us at the top, we are responsible for Gabriel. We know this system's broke. We know this system is failing children. How dare we point to the social worker? How dare we do that? We are accountable for what happened to this child. And, and it's, 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 it's a disgrace that, that we are allowed to point the finger to the people that they, their own testimony is. We need a thousand more and they gave them 50. I mean, come on, let, let's put the accountability where it lies. I'm not blaming the social workers. They are overburdened with, with, with four or five times as many cases. What I, what, who I'm blaming is in part the state legislature for not passing laws, making it illegal for someone to make a false report. Therefore, tying up those social workers, you know, with five, six, seven times as many cases as they need, while the Gabriels are falling through the crest. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.